Lutheran Church in Brantford. And I wonder where it was. And we'll Good morning. We welcome you this morning. Ask you to join in to worship as we believe that God joined us in the worship gathering. This service is a direct broadcast from the sanctuary of Trinity Lutheran Church, 530 North 4th Street, Northwest, in Faribault, Minnesota. Pastor the Reverend Michael Nerva will be our liturgist with Pastor Warren Schmidt delivering the sermon titled An Angry Jesus for Good Reason. Our organist will be Nancy Simonson with special music by the Trinity Choir and the Handbells. Our order of liturgy, order of liturgy will be Divine Service 1. The radio broadcast this Sunday is given in loving memory of Violet Rest by her husband Raymond and family. Our first, sir, excuse me, our first hymn will be To Your Temple, Lord I Come. This, sir, this hymn is printed in, the, in our bulletin. Please join our, Congress as a, our congregation as they greet each other. And let us quiet our hearts for worship. Please rise. 
And we make our beginning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ. Have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, his mercy has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Amen. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O oh God, whose glory it is always to have mercy, be gracious to all who have gone astray from your ways, and bring them again with penitent hearts and steadfast faith to embrace and hold fast the unchangeable truth of your word. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading is from Exodus chapter 20. We begin reading at verse 1. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you up out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that that is in the earth beneath or that which that is in the water under the earth. You shall not <coughs> bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother, 
that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. And you shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. This is the word of the Lord. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We begin reading at verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews, and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to the worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. He is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And please stand. Holy Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. We begin reading verse 13. The Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons, and the money changers sitting there, and making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. His disciples remembered that it was written, Zeal for your house will consume me. And so the Jews said to him, What sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When, therefore, he was raised from the dead, 
his disciples remembered that he had said this. And they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. Please join us for our next hymn, Come Unto, Come Unto Me, Ye Weary, number 684 in the Lutheran Service Book. Peace be ours from God our Father, from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We hear again the first verses of today's gospel reading from John chapter 2. The, pa the Passover of the Jews was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple he found those who were selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and money changers sitting there. Making a whip of cords, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. Dear friends in Christ, my theme this morning is, to, is a question. An angry Jesus... Do we see him angry here? And the answer to that question is yes, my second part of the theme. He's angry for a good reason. And by the time we get to the close of the sermon, can we ask ourselves, is God angry at us? And my answer will be a very definite no. We live before him as forgiven children of the Heavenly Father. Now, I think most of you, like me, have a visual impression 
of the physical appearance of our Lord when he lived here on earth among us for those 33 years as our brother in the human race, a true human being, someday, someday we'll find out was our visual impression very correct. We'll meet him face to face. What a glorious day. Over the centuries, many painters, many of them considered masters, have painted scenes of Jesus, focusing in on the facial expressions. A lot of them focus around the Lenten story that we're now observing. Also, as he hangs on the cross, and there we see pains of agony, distress. It was no imaginary thing. He was truly in the grips of awful pain. Of course, there are other times when he was in his ministry publicly reaching out to people, going among the crowds, teaching them, healing them, interacting with them. And there we see the facial expression as one of compassion, of caring, of empathy. You see him and you're drawn to come to him. That's why I chose as the hymn we've just sung, Come unto me, ye weary, and I will give you rest. I, I think those hymns, words of that hymn expressed a facial expression of invitation, coming and meeting our Lord. Have you ever asked yourself, can you visualize Jesus as smiling, even laughing? I think there are several instances in the Gospels where we can. Let's take, for example, the time he fed the 5,000, especially the theme and the story as it's recorded in, in Matthew chapter 14. Remember the story, the very beautiful scene on the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee. Steep cliffs to the south, but the slopes coming down to the seacoast, very green grass. Small villages, no village could, uh, could have, have a place for that many people to come together and hear one person. But out there in the rural area, and there this crowd had been gathered to hear Jesus' teaching, and the hours passed by, and suddenly the day was gone. The sun was setting behind the western cliffs, and the disciples are concerned. And they come to Jesus and they say, Lord, this is a desolate place and the day is over. Send the crowds away to go to the villages to buy food for themselves. And now visualize the look on Jesus' face as he said to them, they don't need to go away. You give them something to eat. And the disciples must have looked at Jesus and said, 5,000 people here and uh, we're going to feed all these people? And one of them even said, what do we have? We have five loaves of bread and two fish. We found this little guy who had his mother pack a lunch. But that wouldn't be enough at all. I'm sure Jesus was smiling at them as, they, as he tested them to see their reaction. And he was teaching them a lesson. He would supply their needs. Again, a very different situation where I think Jesus was smiling. Uh, ruler of the synagogue named Jairus in Capernaum, also in that same area, the northern shore of the Sea of Galilee, had a 12-year-old daughter. She was very ill, and he came to Jesus with this problem. Lord, come to my house. My daughter is gravely ill. And so they go there, and they arrive, alas, too late. And already there are professional mourners, a very strange custom in that day and age, when there's death in a family, we want to express our sympathy to them in a quiet, dignified manner. But in that day and age, professional mourners came and set off wailing and weeping. That's what was supposed to be done. And Jesus comes to that house, and of course, he realizes she has already died. But he says, she is not dead, she is alive. <laughs> and these professional mourners can turn off the tears and it actually says they laughed at him. And Jesus went into the room where the dead girl lay, took her by the hand and said, young lady, arise, talitha kumi, as it is in the uh, Mark's account. We know the exact Aramaic words he spoke. And she rose and he took her by the hand and brought her out of the room past all those mourners I'm sure smiling at them. He wasn't saying, look, I have the last laugh, but I was right. She's not, she's not dead. She is sleeping. 
but then where the smile must really come on his face, he takes the young girl the, to the parents. And what does he say? Give her something to eat. 12-year-olds, 13-year-olds, male or female, they're always hungry, aren't they? She's really alive. Give her something to eat. Joy that came on his face spread to those around him during his ministry. I'm not in any way saying he was a stand-up comic who told a joke and then gave the punchline. But his presence, his teaching, his power, his care brought smiles and joy to people wherever he went. Now, that brings us to today's text. What have we here? An angry Jesus. This is a Passover time in Jerusalem also, not the last time when he would be arrested and put to death. This is earlier in his ministry, one or two years earlier. He comes into the temple courtyard, and what does he see there? A case of chaos. There are people selling oxen and goats and sheep and even pigeons. Why are they doing that? Because the pilgrims have come from all over the world to offer their sacrifices there, so they must buy their animals. It was the boom day for these merchants, like Black Friday here in our country. But what does Jesus do? He takes some cords and fashions a whip and drives them out. Anyone think they'd ever go into a box store or a big supermarket and say on the Friday after Thanksgiving, get out of here, close your doors? You'd have a lot of trouble, but Jesus did. And then it said, he even said, get rid of these pigeons. I wonder if he made them open the doors of the cages and see them flutter away. It was a scene of utter chaos. And then the other half of it was, he went over to the side where there were some tables where the money changers were working. What were they doing? Well, the pilgrims had to change their money from other countries into the coin of the realm. Just as we do today, you get off an airport in, in Canada and you change your dollars into loonies, or you go to Europe and you change your dollars into euros, or in Israel, into shekels. Was he overcharged? Were they overcharging the fee? Just a little uh, side thing. If you go overseas today, don't change your money in an airport. Find a bank and you'll save a lot of money doing that. But Jesus turns over the tables of the money changer and those coins go clanking around on the stone floor and they go scurrying after to pick it all up. Well, what kind of a picture do we get of Jesus then of his physical appearance? <laughs> he wasn't a tiny little guy who one guard could have come over and just privately ushered him out, maybe even by force, and get him out of the courtyard. He must have been an imposing physical figure. Because a couple of years later, when they wanted to arrest him, they conspired to do that at nighttime when there was no crowd around. Remember, they brought a whole band of soldiers out to the Garden of Gethsemane. So, Jesus did get angry. He had good reason. The place of worship had become a noisy place where people could not meditate and pray and offer their praises to the Lord. This is not the only time in the Gospels where, he see, where we see Jesus angry. Every time we have a baptism, last evening we had a baptism and the Gospel reading there is from Mark. And it tells about the time when parents were bringing their children to Jesus to have him bless them. And what happened? The disciples said, don't bring these children around, they'll upset things, we, they'll be noisy, we don't want them around. And the text very clearly says Jesus was indignant not at the parents, because it said he took the children up in his arms and blessed them. He was indignant, he was angry at the disciples. And he says, permit the children come unto me, forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. So, we see Jesus as a true human being, but a perfect human being. When he was angry, he was angry for a good reason. What did we call righteous indignation? But now what about our lives? Because none of us, I'm sure, has completely got our anger under control. We aren't always cool, calm, and collected. What about our anger? Well, many times after we're angry, we stop and think about it, and we see it in a clear light. My anger was really sort of selfishly motivated, something personally that irritated me. 
And maybe I'm sorry for it then. I wish I hadn't. Well, is our Christian faith a course in anger, anger management? Every once in a while you see when a family court judge tells the couple, you go to, go to a class for anger management. Well, I can give you one verse that would help. Ephesians 4, 2 says from Paul, Be angry, do not sin, and let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So Paul admits Christians in Ephesus at least were angry. And he says, don't let it lead to sin. Don't let the sin go down upon your wrath. Some marriage counselors said, well, couples, if you're having an argument and a spat, settle it before you go to bed and for sleep for the night. Maybe that's not always true. Sometimes you have a spat and you sleep on it overnight. In the morning you get up and you see it in a totally different light and it's all settled. But the overcoming of our anger comes to us from the heart of the gospel where Jesus says to us, you are forgiven. I forgive you. And now as we pray in the Lord's Prayer, as we will in just a few minutes, we promise, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Forgiveness that starts with God and comes to us helps us overcome our anger to forgive one another. Was Jesus ever angry when he went to the cross? It's an interesting thing. I've shown you times in his ministry where he was angry. But as we study the passion history, we do not see any anger coming from Jesus. We see it all around him. We'll be hearing the story of his trial before Pilate. I think that comes up a week from Wednesday. And there's the mob outside of Pilate's quarters shouting, Crucify him! Crucify him! The anger that's there. And even at Golgotha, as those Roman soldiers are driving the spikes through his hands and his feet, Jesus does not respond in anger. He calls out and says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And then as he hangs on the cross, people are shouting to him, He saved others, but he cannot save himself. Come down from the cross if you're really the Christ. He doesn't respond in anger. One of the thieves to his left says, Yes, uh, Come down if you're really the Messiah. But the one on the right says, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus speaks that beautiful word of forgiveness. Today you'll be with me in paradise. The gospel tells us that when we are with Christ, God is not angry at us. Many times when something hard or tragic comes in our life, we're thinking, God, what did I do? Are you angry at me? And the answer is no. Jesus brought reconciliation. Paul says God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. The opposite of anger between people is reconciliation. And that's what's come into the world and into our lives through Christ Jesus. Know this for sure, my friends. That when you have Christ at your side, when he is your Lord and Savior, when you reach out to him in faith, and we're hearing about the hands of Jesus, when Jesus takes our hand and we follow him, God is not angry at one another, at him, us. And we then can forgive others, and anger is overcome. And so we have peace. The way I end every sermon, the peace of God that passes all understanding Keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus because our Lord is not angry with us. Amen. We rise and make confession of our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures, 
and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. He will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for their mission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. And let us pray. We pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord Jesus, in today's gospel, we have seen a time in your life and ministry when you were angry with what you saw in the temple of Jerusalem. The place of worship was defiled by the noise and the activity of, of, of commerce and banking. And in your righteous anger, you changed the temple to a place of worship and prayer for that day. We confess that in the activity and business of our lives today, we are often distracted from finding quiet moments of prayer and meditation with you. Thank you for this place of worship where we come together as your family for these moments of devotion and fellowship. We especially praise you for the gospel message that we are reconciled to our Heavenly Father through the merits of your perfect life and sacrificial death for us. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. Holy Spirit, help us grow in faith that all traces of anger and bitterness may be replaced with forgiveness toward one another. Even as we have first been forgiven by our Heavenly Father, accept our thanks that your grace has been given to another child through holy baptism, Grace Lynn Rose and Irene Holtz, who was baptized here last evening. We pray also uh, that the kingdom of Christ church may be extended to the work of missionaries around the world. We focus especially on our partners in the Philippines and their video ministry. Give them special patience and wisdom as they struggle with the loss of funds by a scam artist via online fraud. And we pray that these obstacles will be overcome and their video ministry would continue to be blessed by you. Lord, in your mercy. Heavenly Father, we live in a troubled world of violence and strife. We pray for the men and women of our armed forces and also for the, the peace officers and first responders of our homeland, that they may be kept safe as they carry out their missions and assignments, often in dangerous surroundings. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, you're the giver of every good gift, and we ask that you give strength and comfort and healing to Hank, and to Thera, to Mandy Bloom, to Everett and Elda Fuchs, to Christine Selentine, to Pastor Robert Snyder, uh, Patty Stonehouse, Luke Sparks, and Mary Wool, and those whose names we carry in our hearts. In this Lenten season, grant us all the gift of healing, both physical and spiritual, with the balm of your grace and mercy. For into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting your mercy, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. An offering for the Lord will now be received.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death in the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, in the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you, this do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it, in remembrance of me.
please join us for our next hymn, How Firm a Foundation, number 728 in the Lutheran Service Book. Please rise. In the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen and preserve you in body and soul to life everlasting. Depart in peace. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift. And we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us the same in faith toward you and fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Please be seated. A few announcements I give to you. The first is the Lively Five neighborhood group will be hosting the supper on March 11th. Donations are needed. Please sign up at the Information Center in the Narthex. All the proceeds will be donated to the Galu Reet Family Fund. And on March 21st and 22nd, there will be a special theme of Celebration of Life with Dr. James Lamb, Director of Lutherans for Life as guest preacher and Bible class leader. A door offering will be taken to help support the work of Lutherans for Life and to be gathered on, that, on those occasions. 
On Sunday, uh, March 22nd, during the 1030 service, our uh, vicar, um, Galu uh, Reet, will be uh, installed. And following the service, there'll be a catered lunch in the gym. Please sign up the information center to bring bars for dessert. And this Sunday, March 8th, at 6.30, there'll be a special voters meeting to call a seminary candidate to serve as our assistant pastor. And finally, the FLS Spring Musical will be held at Trinity on Thursday, March 12th at 6.30. If you're invited to attend. And we continue then with our last hymn, Almighty Father, Bless the Word. As we come, come to the close of another service, we pray that it has been a blessing to you to strengthen your faith in Christ. This service was a direct broadcast from the sanctuary of Trinity Lutheran Church in Fairwood, Minnesota. The radio broadcast this Sunday was given in loving memory of Violet Rest by her husband Raymond and family. Pastor Reverend Michael Nerva, Nerva was their liturgist with Pastor Warren Schmidt delivering the sermon entitled An Angry Jesus for Good Reason. If you like a copy of Pastor Schmidt's sermon, please write to us at Trinity Radio Club, 534th Street Northwest, Fairwood, Minnesota, 55021. Please be sure to include your name and full return address. Our organist this morning was Nancy Simonson, with special music provided by Handbells and the Trinity Choir. We'd like to thank the following. In memory of Sally Anderson, a gift of $10 is given by Helen Spitzak, and a gift of $15 by, was given by Lou and Ar Arlene Rolfe. This coming Wednesday, March 11th, our special midweek Lenten service broadcast will be on Power 96, 95.9 FM. This will be to the boys' basketball tournament. Again, this Wednesday's 5.30 midweek Lenten service broadcast will not be on KDHL. will be on Power 96, 95.9 on the FM dial. So until it's coming Wednesday at 5.30 p.m., we return you now to the downtown studios of KDHL.